I think where we're transforming to is how we do this, how we do AI at scale. How do we truly become an AI-driven company? There's so many thousands or maybe tens of thousands of people. Jobs are squared in the bullseye of some of my friends in AI. And frankly, those tens of thousands of people doing those jobs now have no idea. So the standard way to grow lettuce, throw down a whole bunch of seeds and a bunch of them germinate. They actually have too much. And so a farmer goes through and they say, you know, this one's doing well, that one's not doing well. And they actually over-fertilize the ones that aren't doing well, effectively killing them. And then that actually makes the other ones thrive, the thinning process. So they built a robot that can go into a field to ascertain the state of the crop and then take the appropriate action. Just doing that, they increase yields by 10%. This is probably the oldest business in the world. You still have optimization to be done. Now AI is being incorporated into all sorts of things. The Alexa, uh, Echo, or Google Home, or Siri. That's very garden variety AI. This is really first inning AI. We always try to not just do technology for technology's sake, but actually solving a consumer problem or pain point. We feel like we need to have the right data and the right talent to actually really take advantage of AI, so we're kind of focused on that first. But we're also experimenting in a couple of different ways of getting some AI out there just to test. Most CEOs are asking themselves, what can I do with AI? How can I incorporate this? This is clearly the future, but they don't really know, and that's part of the problem. It's very abstract. Most of the applications you see today involve machine learning. Google image search, right? That's machine learning comparing things. A certain kind of ad on Facebook, that's machine learning trying to tailor those ads to the preferences that you have expressed on Facebook. The more advanced stuff, that's not really in the wild yet, but for the you know, largest tech companies. So artificial intelligence actually has its roots back in computing. Alan Turing even, he was really trying to recapitulate pieces of intelligence, what made a machine intelligent. And he recognized very early on that that lived in the information space, processing information to make it useful somehow. The term artificial intelligence was coined in the 60s. We started to understand that the brain was, was definitely electrical. In the 40s, we actually defined how it works electrically, how information is represented, what we call spiking. That actually was concurrent with a lot of innovations on the computing side because we said, well, brains are information tools, computers are information tools, and there's always this parallel. The first computer science department and the first neuroscience department started about a year apart. When we figured out that neurons represent information in a certain way, we tried to simulate those things in, in synthetic systems. We thought it would be really easy because we figured out all these principles from the brain. Turns out it's a little more difficult than that. So the field kind of had its ups and downs until computing got to a point where it was dense enough. And the data set sizes got to the point where they're big enough. 2010, 2011 timeframe is when neural networks met, Moore's law met big data, this whole field exploded. It's gonna change with time, but overall the goal of a learning system is to find useful structure and data. Prominent AI researchers have said that AI will be like electricity. Electricity was a big deal. It was this new invention that people talked about. Nobody talks about electricity anymore. And that's where we are with AI. X years down the road, sooner rather than later, AI will be infused in all these things in ways that we couldn't possibly fathom today. really have reached a tipping point in AI. Some of the more powerful elements of AI, the deep learning of AI, you're just now able to use it in some pretty incredible use cases. The way that you use a telephone is different from the way that I use a telephone, the way that we actually key. We have artificial intelligence that can detect your behavior. So if I left my phone there and you picked it up and tried to make a payment, it would know it's not me. When we're unloading a truck full of strawberries, one of the drivers can open up the case and take a photo. 
we can determine whether it was sent sustainably and how long that fruit is going to last. I think AI can be the future of personalization and I think personalization is where retail and beauty are going. We have what's called Sephora Virtual Artist, which is our augmented reality beauty experience. We're using computer vision so it can kind of map your facial features and know where to place the makeup when you look at it virtually. We've actually been using AI to really reshape the entire end-to-end -end shopping journey for the customer. Increasingly, you use AI to show up through targeted display ads in places where the consumer is shopping. So if you let us know that you're interested in certain lifestyles and certain items, we'll make sure that we personalize the recommendations that we make for you. Our customers use a lot of AI. The self-driving systems um, use it for object detection. We work with people that are perceiving the occupants. Are they happy? Are they scared? Are they losing trust with the vehicle? There are already dozens of applications of AI. I only expect that to increase. There is no technological development with more potential than artificial intelligence. Because it is a suite of capabilities, it's going to solve simple things in our lives and the extraordinary things. What is really exciting about that for the business community, there's money to be made. There's so much excitement around AI, rightfully so, but if we're not thoughtful about how we go about building these systems, the outcome could be disastrous. If there aren't enough of us engaged, and I don't actually even just mean women, I mean a diverse group of people, then we're gonna get computers who think like some bro culture on the West Coast. Bias can be inherent to AI and to algorithms if we allow it to be. It comes down to people. If those teams aren't reflective of humanity, then the algorithms aren't going to be reflective of humanity, and that has hugely negative ramifications. One of the biggest concerns is that workplaces will lose their humanity if we keep incorporating more and more AI into you know, the office. There's a lot of algorithms that are being put into place that help the companies in their recruitment processes. Who are they going to hire? Who are they going to fire? And so on. But the big question is, what data are they using? Are they bringing in your social media data, your private data? Do they get access to your health file, your financial data? The amount of information that we um, freely give or unknowingly give to corporations and governments is massive. AI will allow those groups to manage in a very efficient way. Whether that's something that's good for me or bad for me, I think depends on who's doing it and how. We have all sleepwalked into this current situation. We haven't really understood what it was we were giving away when we were using all of these services, when we were using social media. What is it we are paying with to get all of these services? We've got people arguing that AI is great and other people arguing that it's, that it's the end of humanity. The answer is always somewhere in between. It is something we have to think pretty deeply about. Every single technological development has changed jobs, right? I mean, that's nothing new. Where I think this whole transformation is new is its magnitude. It's going to affect all of us. I am concerned that these uh, hype discussion about evil AI killer robots, it, it, it whitewashes the real challenges. And I think job displacement is, the, it, it is a big one. A lot of jobs will change, meaning that we will have to learn new things. And this brings us to the whole question of re- and upskilling. This is going to be one of the major challenges of our time, making sure that everybody can follow the developments and have an opportunity to thrive in the labour market. What happens is jobs shift, right? We have about 18,000 new jobs just for grocery picking and delivery services. Robotics, AI, technological advances are rapidly disrupting and transforming the nature of work and the workplace. We know what happens with industrial revolutions. There is a transition time in which a whole bunch of people get disrupted right out of their jobs. Once it's through that transition time, there are better quality jobs and more jobs for everyone. Predictions are that AI will create many more jobs than it will destroy. If those jobs that will be created 
are bad jobs, are paid under the living wage, are precarious, then that is nothing we should celebrate. I don't know if you've seen this picture of sheep problem. If you showed um, a computer scientist three or four years ago a picture of a flock of sheep and asked them to build an algorithm to count how many sheep were in the picture, they would have told you it was impossible. Now, that's trivial. Overnight, that changed. When I think about how fast AI and machine learning is gonna move, and that's the kind of speed we're looking at, that's exciting. Right now, the depth of expertise required is extremely high. It's not integrated at all into the way that people do their business today. It's a revolutionary technology. Certainly, the machines are getting much, much better at a lot of things than we are. It's going to be much more integrated into our lives. I think we're just at the beginning of trying to understand how it fits in.